Welcome to America's Vanished Children. I'm your host, Carol Healy. Our show focuses on missing children, and we need your help to provide us with leads that might aid in the recovery of these children. Now, tonight we're going to be talking with three parents who are searching for their daughters. We're going to hear a little bit about their ongoing investigations, and we're going to show you photos of these children and others and give you the number for the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children should you have any information regarding these children or others. That number is 1-800-843-5678. And we also have a number for the hearing impaired that's 1-800-826-7653. We're also going to share with you a success story. A newborn baby who was abducted from the hospital was recently recovered and reunited with her parents. Now the Justice Department tells us that 359,000 children are abducted every year. We need your help. So stay tuned and watch our show. You might have information that we need. I'm joined now in the studio with Kim Schwartz. She's been searching for her daughter Amber for four and a half years. Kim, welcome. Hi, thank you for having me on. Now before we get into the questions I'd like to ask you, uh, I want to show the viewers two photos of Amber. One of four and a half years ago and one that's been age progressed to her age now, which would be approximately twelve and a half. Um, but I, I'd like to go through what she was wearing on that day. Uh, that day Amber was wearing purple cords, a white short sleeve t-shirt with teal colored bands around these sleeves and the bottom of the shirt with multicolored pictures of sunglasses on the front, pink socks and uh, white and pink LA Gear tennis shoes. Um, it was approximately 4.15 on June 3rd, 1988 when Amber went out to jump rope in the front yard. Uh, approximately 4.30 when I went out to check on her, she was gone. Um, 15 minutes later? Correct. Right. No one saw anything. I was home. I didn't even hear anything. Um, Amber is hearing impaired, was not wearing her hearing aid at the time. Um, so she would speak in a kind of a nasally tone. And that's something that she'll still have now. I mean, that Correct. hearing impairment's permanent, so her voice will, will be different. Right, right. Um, she also suffers from migraines, or at least she did four and a half years ago. Um, so if she happens to be a child taken into a hospital, you know, with, uh, with migraines and happens to be a child with migraines and is hearing impaired, that would, that would sure, you know, be a clue that it could be Amber. Another thing, um, since it's four and a half years later and she's grown, um, in your family, people tend to be pretty tall, so is it pretty likely that she's probably tall now? Right. Um, if you judge by her older brother, who is very tall and thin, and the fact that her father and myself are, are tall and thin, mm -hmm. her father was, um, chances are Amber would be. Now, you recently started something, something positive out of all this called the Amber Foundation. Can you tell us something about that? Correct. The Amber Foundation was formed just a few months after Amber was taken. Um, I had the need basically to be very involved in what was happening with my daughter um, to deal with uh, stranger cases or unknown and with the sub-issues of what is happening to these children, um, to enlighten the public as to what is happening, to educate children on how to be safe. What did you do at Amber Day? I know recently Pinall hosted Amber Day. Right. What Amber, kind of events? Amber Day is always in August, um, somewhere very close to Amber's birthday, which is the 19th. Um, it is basically a function put together to, to get families together to come to one large location where they can get their children fingerprinted, videoed, pick up information, not only from our organization but from other missing children organizations throughout California, um, to listen to speakers such as police departments, FBI, and families of other missing kids. So that you can give advice to other families about how they should uh, not leave their children in cars? Correct. What other kinds of things do people take for granted and do all the time they really well, shouldn't? Lots of latchkey kids nowadays, so if your child is left at home, they should be instructed not to answer the door. Um, but if somebody phones to say that you know, you're unavailable, can they take a message? Never say that you're alone. Um, to walk with crowds of kids or you know, in a group, which uh, in some cases doesn't even help, but at least you know, you've got more kids there, the chances of your child being stolen are uh, much less than if they were walking alone. Um, to teach kids that they are not to go anywhere with anyone at any time, that includes going to a next door neighbor's house for a, a cookie and a glass of milk, um, because you just, you just don't know. You could have a pedophile living right next door to you and not know it. Now, do you still get any leads in, in Amber's case? Yes, um, we do. I've done um, quite a few 
programs such as this and a lot of uh, national programs. The most recent was on the 13th of November was America's Most Wanted. Um, from that particular show, we've generated over 200 calls for Amber. So uh, we still have calls that come in on a daily basis, and she's registered with many organizations um, on a national level, so they receive lots of calls also. Now, if you had something quick to say to other parents out there, uh, any particular quick advice you could give them? Uh, fingerprint your kid. Keep um, updated photos of your children. Um, maybe even, you know, pull a few strings of hair out of their head and, and keep those, you know, for potential, you know, information that the FBI or police would need in the event that their child is missing. I want to thank you for being with us. Thank you for sharing your story. And, and now we're going to show uh, two photos of two other missing children and have the Center for National, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children on the screen as well. This is Gina Dawn Brooks. She's a Caucasian female with blonde hair, green eyes. She disappeared on August 5th, 1989. That was four years ago at the time. She was 13 years old. Now she'll be 17. Again, that was four years ago and, and her hair was blonde at the time. It could be it could be any color now. It could be short. Take a look at that photo. Um, although it was long at the time, it could have been cut and dyed in, in any number of ways. At the time of her disappearance, uh, when she was 13, she weighed 100 pa 108 pounds. She could have increased in weight. Um, she could weigh less. We're not sure. Gina was last seen riding her bike in Fredericktown, Maryland, and the bike was found abandoned. If you have any information, call that number on your screen. That's 1-800-843-5678. This is Michael Massaway. Michael is a Filipino male. He was last seen on January 25th, 1989. At the time, Michael was 16 years old. Again, that was four years ago. He was five feet tall. He weighed 160 pounds. He has black hair, brown eyes. Again, this was four years ago. Uh, Michael would now be about 20 years old and he may look greatly different. He disappeared from San Francisco, California and he may have changed in appearance. He, he may be heavier, we're not sure, but take a good look at that photo. He has glasses, uh, he probably still has glasses. Um, take a good look at that photo. His hair may be short. Call that number if you have any information at all. Michael Massaway, that's one 800 Eight four three five six seven eight. We're going to take a short break, and when we come back, we're going to be talking with another family searching for their daughter. Stay tuned. Many children, after they are either runaways or kidnapped, must turn or are forced into prostitution. Here are sections from a previous program we did on the subject. Investigations in other cities have shown that boys, 13, 14, even younger, are coerced into prostitution with threats of physical violence and are sometimes shipped across state lines, shipped to the older adult men who desire young boys for sexual acts. Occasionally, these boys' episodes with their older clients ends in physical violence. There are men who seek young boys to torture and sometimes to kill. The President's Commission on Obscenity found this is the commission that Richard Nixon repudiated it mentioned in passing that child pornography was a phenomenon of the abuse of children and then went on to say that for every female prostitute of any age in the United States there are nine boys underage who are prostitutes and there was a call boy ring operated out of New York City which had phone hookups with Houston Atlanta Los Angeles New Orleans Washington DC and that callboy ring had a list of 10,000 clients who could call and with a credit card purchase a boy hello hello uh, this is uh, credit card number 06789 uh, I'd like to make an order please go ahead I'm looking for a young male blonde hair blue eyes body hair or no body hair thick body hair please what age uh, 10 to 12 Butch or Femme? Butch, please. What is your address? I'm at the Houston Marriott Hotel, room 313. Wire me $200 now by credit card and have $100 in cash for the boy. He'll be there in 30 minutes. Thank you. Thank you. 
In Houston, I, I give the figure based on, I think, prudent calculations that upwards of 350 boys. are killed deliberately because of this. Many more die of drug overuse, mal malnutrition, of suicide. The national toll per year is in the thousands. Every year, kids die violently because of this. The kind of individuals involved are down the line, almost in every instance in the cases I've investigated, men who are very powerful, usually very wealthy, and usually administrate control over a large number of people. 16-year-old Boyd came to us telling how he'd started as a prostitute at age 12 and now is employed by a large Houston corporation. The corporation pays him from a well-covered slush fund. I'm working right now, you know, like, just, you know, with the corporation. And What's that? How's that work? Well, uh, when their executives are you know, their business people are in town. Uh, they're sent to our apartment, and we entertain them while they're here. Okay, what's that entertainment usually involved? What do they usually demand, or what do they want? Well, it's all kinds of sex and perversions. There's no two alike. I've decided that. Subsequent to the making of this interview, this boy's mutilated body was found. It's closely attached to the major financial, commercial, industrial, educational institutions of our society. It's run by the same people who run those. It's frequented by the same people who occupy management positions in those. It's not the mafia. It's, it's an adjunct of clean business. It's serving the most respectable people we have in our society, the people who uh, are the elite. Young boy prostitutes, 14 and 15 years old, explained one reason they sell their bodies to older men is for money. For some, especially the runaways, the money means survival. A child, an adolescent psychiatrist, explained another motivation, as revenge against a father, stepfather, or older man who sexually molested him at an earlier age. The best information I have is, is that these kids die. They waste away, they kill themselves, somebody kills them, that's it. And we're talking about over half. Over half of the kids who make their living this way for a period don't survive adolescence. Welcome back. Joining us now are Anne and Jim Campbell, searching parents of Amanda Nikki Campbell. Welcome to the show, Anne and Jim. Now, I've got questions for you, but before we get into that, we want to show a photo of Nikki as she was last December 27th when she disappeared. Uh, she was four years old, about five and a half, um, about three feet tall. She'll be five and a half now. She was three feet six inches tall then, 65 pounds. She was wearing a pink jacket, a purple top, purple pants. She had long blonde hair, probably in a ponytail, with bangs. Uh, she has a big smile, great big smile, big dimples. Now, her hair may have changed. She may be a different height now, because she's five and a half now. And she could have, they could have cut her hair, colored it. Um, they, can, they can change her, you know, in a number of ways. She's grown over a year now. No, she's on, yes. Now, take me back to that day and tell me a little bit about what happened on December 27, 1991. Um, I came home from work finding my 16-year-old at the garage door telling me that Jim was unable to locate Nikki. I proceeded to go to her friend's house that she was allowed to go to, unable to contact and get a hold of Nikki, and I came back home met, meeting Sheila's daddy at my driveway. He said, let's go call the police. And when we got there, my 16-year-old said, Mom, I've already called the police. They immediately came out and did a door-to-door -door search until 1 in the morning, still unable to locate Amanda. And um, they came back the next morning and started the search over again at 6 a.m. So they searched for two days, door-to-door, -door, asking everybody. They searched actually three days. Three they days? Did they did it uh, Friday evening, Saturday, and Sunday. Now, they also did a helicopter search, is that They right? did a helicopter search. Mm -hmm. They also did, um, they brought the dogs in, which carried the scent of my daughter and also the scent of her and a vehicle. And what did the dogs find? The dogs um, led them that she was taken out of the neighborhood to the nearest McDonald's and onto I-80 West, which is exactly 90 seconds from my front door. 
And after that, the trail disappeared? Yeah, after that, the trail, yes, because they cannot take the dogs on the freeway. Now, who was the detective who was working with you on this case? De uh, detective Harold Sagan out of Fairfield Police Department. And how do, you, how do you feel about him? He's been fantastic. He's um, done a lot of uh, work and research and investigation and continues to work on leads and following up on information that he has on locating Nikki. He's still working on it? Yes. That's He's, good. He knows my daughter as well as I do now. Now, I know you have, what, three other boys? I have three other boys. And uh, this has, of course, had a great big impact on them. Tell me a little bit about how it's affected your family. Um, we just live one day at a time. Uh, we have Matthew, who, who is Nikki's brother. He is six years old. And um, he, we have to go on for him. He is very important. And they all say their sister's going to come home. They just don't know when. So this is how you live each day at a time. You've got to go on for the rest of your family. That's right. And then I work with Friends of Amanda Campbell, which Kevin Collins set up right after Nikki disappeared. And what we do is we address and stamp envelopes, mailing out her flyer to all the businesses across the United States. And I will continue to do this until the day she's found. Thanks so much for being with us. I have to go now to show you two more photos of other missing children. And we'll have the Center for Missing and Exploited Children. That number is going to be on the screen for you. This is Eileen Michelhoff. Uh, we have two photos of Eileen. One uh, taken when she, approximately when she disappeared, January 30th, 1989. She was 16 at the time. And one uh, as a, an age progressed photo. She's about 20 now and she's probably changed dramatically. Eileen was last seen in Dublin, California on Monday, January 30th, 1989. She was wearing a charcoal gray pullover polo sweater, a horizontally striped pink and gray skirt, black low-top keds and carrying a dark blue backpack. Again, she's now 20 years old. She's probably changed a great deal. Eileen is white with brown hair, curly brown hair and brown eyes and weighed about 115 pounds. She wore braces. This is Jacob Irwin Wetterling. Jacob was abducted at gunpoint on October 22, 1989 from St. Joseph, Minnesota. The abductor was described as a male wearing dark clothing and a mask over his face. Jacob was 13 years old at the time, 5 feet tall and weighed 75 pounds. He has a slim build, brown hair, blue eyes, a mole on his left cheek, and a scar on his knee. We have an age progressed photo of Jacob at the age of 15. He'd be approximately 16 now. We're going to take a short break. Uh, now's a good time. If you haven't before, go ahead and get a pencil or a pen. Jot down that number that's on our screen for the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. Uh, give them a call if you have any information to relate. When we come back, we're going to have a success story. A uh, newborn baby who was abducted from the hospital was recently recovered and reunited with her parents. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Children are the largest group of Americans living below the poverty line. They have to reach higher for what others take for granted. Health care, balanced meals, encouragement to learn. But with help early on, children in your community can gain the skills to get out from below the poverty line. It takes programs like Success by Six and people like you to help them take the first step. Call to learn more. Change the world of a child and you change the world. You know that of the, of the 28 million people in this country living in official poverty, 24 million are women and our kids. And by the year 2000, if this trend continues, and under Reagan it will not only continue but accelerate, um, the entire poverty population will be us and our kids. That's violence. And that 50% um, of women in relationships with men are beaten by them. That means anything from just a slap in the face to murder and that one out of three women can expect to be raped in her lifetime, and that one out of four women under the age, or girls or females under the age of 18, before they reach age 18, will be sexually abused, incestually abused by some member of their family, their father or grandpa. One out of four? One out of four. Yes, I've seen that. One out of four. It's absolutely, an, it's absolutely an epidemic. So think of these little children that are molested as little ones. One out of three females are molested before they're 18 years old, and that's just from the reported cases one out of five males. It, I just worked with a man, a nurse in the hospital molested him when he was a child. 
It's everywhere. It's, it's, it's unbelievable. And our system is in denial. They don't want to see this. And to see it... They have to see their own. So you really want to make sure you know who the people are with your children. Uh, right before I came here, a case broke out in Dayton, a teacher in a Catholic school, which scared me because I send my children to private schools, was molesting, molesting the kids. This happened right as I'm sitting here. This just broke in Dayton, Ohio. Well, usually we hear about men molesting little girls and yeah. little boys. Do women do this? Women do it as well. They really yes, do. they do. So it could be a teacher. It could be the coach. It could be the doctor that you go to. On June 12th of 1992, a parent's worst nightmare came true. A newborn baby was abducted from her mother by a woman who posed as an employee for WIC, a county program for women, infants, and children. The woman approached the baby's mother, Jessica Mamini, while she was in a room at a Berkeley hospital and persuaded Jessica to allow her to take baby carry out for standard hospital procedures. Hundreds of volunteers helped search for baby carry by creating flyers and making the public aware of the abduction. A public plea for the return of their daughter was made by Baby Carrie's mother, Jessica, and her father, Christia Ray Rosales. As the search stretched into weeks and then months, hope for the child's return had begun to fade. But due to public awareness, Carrie was found three months later. The abductor, Karen Lee Hughes, was taken into custody, and Carrie's mother was notified that her daughter had been found in healthy condition. With her baby back in her arms, Jessica can once again look forward to motherhood. That was a wonderful recovery story. I hope we can add many more. Now I'm joined by Georgia Hilgeman. She's the executive director of the Vanished Children's Alliance. Welcome to the show, Georgia. Thank you. It's a pleasure being here. Now, the Vanish Children's Alliance was involved in the Baby Carrie recovery case. We were involved in the case during the three months that Baby Carrie was missing. And Baby Carrie, I'm happy to say, was located as a result of a tip from a neighbor to the, of the abductor who was aware that Baby Carrie was missing and became suspicious when, this, when her neighbor showed up with a child that did not seem to be hers and the stories were conflicting. So after a thousand sightings in baby Carrie, there was in fact one tip that led to the happy reunion of mother and child. That's something important for our viewers to keep in mind. I mean, if they see something suspicious, they can do something about it. Absolutely, and we are uh, absolutely in need of the public to participate in assisting the efforts to bring children home. And what would you suggest, um, if somebody sees something suspicious, who should they call? Vanished Children's Alliance? Uh, they should call, number one, their law enforcement agency. They can contact the Vanished Children's Alliance at 1-800-VANISHED. We have a toll-free sighting line, and we will then take that information and get it into the proper hands. Now, baby Carrie has been reunited with her parents, and they're doing well? They're doing real well, and as a matter of fact, a week after the recovery, I was able to hold baby Carrie in my arms at a picnic. So it was... It was uh, the realization that, in fact, all our efforts bring a child home, and mm -hmm. that is very rewarding. Now, tell me how you became involved with Vanish Children's Alliance. I became involved because of a personal experience. I had a missing child for four and a half years, and as a result of that personal experience, after she was located, I became involved in the formation of this organization, which today is a national organization dealing with the prevention, location, and reunification of missing children. One of the things that made you uh, build the Vanished Children's Alliance, uh, there was nothing to help you. There were no you... organizations that I was aware of in those days, and I was left to my own resources to try to locate my child, and, and I made a lot of mistakes, and actually sort of graduated from the School of Hard Knocks, mm -hmm. and through that what I learned, I've been able to put into an agency and educate staff and train law enforcement agencies on uh, improved ways of locating children. There are um, several different categories of missing children. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yes. Uh, the three main categories of missing children are those children that run away from home. The second category are those children that are taken by family members, usually non-custodial parents. And the smallest category, however, perhaps the most endangered, are those children that are taken by non-family members, 
people who are not related to the children may be known by the children or unknown by the children. Maybe someone in the community, um, someone walking up and down the street, walking their puppy every day, or a neighbor. Uh, that person is known to the child, so that person is not a stranger, but that person could in fact be the person responsible for taking a child away. So one of the things you'd like to do through Vanished Children's Alliance and the other agencies is educate parents and their children about what a stranger is, what an acquaintance is. Exactly. All types of uh, safety information is important to be known by community members and the public at large. Uh, one of the things I wanted to find out is what people in the community can look for. What kinds of things can they be alerted to that might be amiss, that might tell them that something needs to be investigated here? When a child shows up to a home where there wasn't a child before, when the child's uh, I identity seems to be changed, a child uses different names, or the child's hair has been dyed, or a little boy is dressed up as a little girl, when something seems different, I think it's important that the public sort of follow that instinct and that gut reaction and to take some... Uh, do something about it and contact law enforcement, contact the Vanished Children's Alliance. Uh, just don't forget about it because it could mean, mean the difference between a child remaining missing and a child coming home. If you had advice to give to parents, just a little capsule to tell parents, give me a, just a few seconds. Uh, I would say develop communication with your child so there is an open flow of communication. Do not leave young children unattended and um, lis listen to your children listen to them because they may be giving you messages about what's occurring in the community. Thank you, Georgia. Thank you. We have two more children that we'd like to show you on our screen. We'll show you their photos and give you the Center uh, for the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. Thank you. This is Jennifer Nicole Patterson. Jennifer was last seen in Spring Lake, North Carolina on June 23, 1991. She's a white female, approximately nine years old, four feet five inches tall, weighing about sixty pounds. Her hair and eyes are brown. She has a freckle on the end of her nose and a small scar on her right temple and a scar between her eyes. This is Charles Arlen Henderson, last seen on July 25, 1991 in Moscow Mills, Missouri. Charles is four feet six inches tall and weighs approximately seventy-five pounds. He has blonde hair and blue eyes. He was 11 years old at the time of his disappearance. He has a slender build, a light complexion. He was last seen wearing a camouflage t-shirt with camouflage pants. His hair was cut in a crew cut. If you have any information, call the number on your screen. Any information we can get from you is, of course, very important. But equally important is prevention. So here's Ben with some safety tips for your family to prevent child abductions. My name is Ben, and welcome to Safety Tips. I hope you practice these safety tips because you're going to need to know them. Number one, my family uses a secret code word. If anybody comes to pick me up at school and they don't know the secret code word, then I don't go with them, even if I know them. Number two, my parents tell me to use the buddy system and walk and play in groups because there's safety in numbers. Number three, my parents said if an adult tells me a secret, then I can tell them, because they're my friends. Number four, my parents say that if a guy comes up to you, or a lady comes up to you, and says they're a police officer, then they've got to have a badge, a uniform, and a police car. Number five, my parents taught me the three rules if I ever get in a dangerous situation. Number one, I can s say no. Number two, I can run away screaming help. Number three, I'll tell a trusted adult. Number six, when I'm home alone, I keep the doors and windows locked. Thank you, and practice these safety tips, please. Thanks for watching our show tonight. I hope we've given you a whole new awareness of the issue of missing children. Again, call that number on our screen. That's the 1-800 number for the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. The information you might have doesn't have to be limited to children that we've featured tonight. If you have information regarding any missing children at all, please give us a call.
Thanks again for watching. I'm your host, Carol Healy, and I'll see you next time. To Victor, this isn't just a drawing, it's a cry for help. Listen to the children. Learn to protect them from drugs and violence. Call now and take a bite out of crime.